Yes. So, um, sorry I'm a bit late. Bloody patience get in the way. You'll, you'll find out one day. Um, so guys, um, I did a talk last term on sort of emergency eye stuff. And uh, if there's not a video online already, then there will be one soon where this lecture was recorded uh, from last term. So that lecture was sort of acute, red eye, pain, you know, emergency acute stuff. Today's lecture is about common and chronic eye conditions, okay? And that's pretty much the whole curriculum, or definitely 80% or more of it. So between that lecture and this one, um, that's most of the eye curriculum. You do have your workshop. Obviously, you guys haven't done that yet. That's this Friday, isn't it? Is that right? Yeah. So you've got your workshop and then you've got your eye clinic placements, but, but today will be half the theoretical content you need for ophthalmology. Uh, my name's Hesom, I'm an ophthalmologist, obviously. Um, so we'll go th through a few things today. I just want to touch on the curriculum, then go through some of the chronic and common conditions, then talk about a few systemic uh, medical conditions with ocular manifestations. These slides will all be on LMS, by the way, as well as the video, so you can take notes if you want to, but you probably don't need to. Um, and you're welcome to ask questions at any time. Just put your hand up. Um, little bit, and well, I'll touch a little bit on epidemiology at the end and low vision services in Australia before we wrap up. Uh, so before I start, does anybody have any burning questions that you've been waiting years to ask an ophthalmologist? Plenty of you wear glasses, so there's obviously eye problems in the room. I'm blind without glasses. Like, I'm almost clinically blind without glasses. So um, I know how it feels. Um, okay, so if there's no questions, I'll, I'll carry on. So curriculum overview. Have you guys seen this? No? Yes, some of you. So this is pretty much your curriculum for eyes. It looks kind of daunting. I think there's about 50 conditions on there. My advice is each condition can be summarized in on one side of a palm card, something like five to eight bullet points. And really, as long as you, I think understanding is more important than memorizing. You kind of have to memorize, but if you understand it, it'll be easier for you. Um, so it shouldn't be as daunting as it looks. And also, for each of the conditions that I go through today, I do have a slide with bullet points on it, so that can be your, that can be your palm card, okay? So one way to think about eyes, how eyes present, people either present with painful red eyes or they present with visual, <coughs> visual disturbance or both. So it's just an easy, logical way to think about why people come in the door with eye problems. Another way to think about it is common stuff and then serious or dangerous stuff. And then, there, there, and then there's, a uh, there's an overlap. So today we'll mainly focus on the common non-dangerous stuff, but we'll also talk about a couple of lid tumors and diabetic retinopathy as well, which can certainly be, both of those can be uh, sight-threatening, and in the case of lid tumors, they can be life-threatening. All right, so let's get into the meat of it, starting off with common causes of red eye. What's the most common cause of red eye? Anyone? Guess. Sometimes there's, sorry? Foreign body's common, yeah, yeah. It's probably not the most common one, but it's definitely common. Friction from what? <laughs> That's a good thought. <laughs> Usually if someone's rubbing their eye really vigorously, something else is up, whether it's dry eye or a foreign body. Has anyone had a foreign body in their eye? How did that feel? It's terrible. It's worse than you think. I've had three, so I know how that feels. Um, so what's more common than foreign bodies is con just conjunctivitis. And or conjunctivitis. Who's had conjunctivitis? Yeah, a few people. What was that like, lady in the front? Pretty crap, yeah, yeah. Was it viral or, or bacterial? Viral, yeah, 
So most of them are viral. Do you know what proportion are viral? I don't expect you to know. Yeah, probably about 70%, up to 90% are viral. So most conjunctivitis is viral. So it looks something like this, okay? Red eyes often starts unilateral, becomes bilateral. Um, typically, we sort of describe viral conjunctivitis as having a clear discharge, clear watery discharge, whereas bacterial conjunctivitis that I'll talk about in a moment has more of a mucoid or mucopolulent discharge, so kind of thick and ropey. Um, so this is certainly m more common. Usually gets better on its own. Um, of that 70 to 90% that are viral, the majority are due to some strain of adenovirus. And there are many, many strains of adenovirus and they're always changing and mutating. Hence why it's pretty much impossible to have an effective treatment or cure for viral conjunctivitis. So viral conjunctivitis management comes down to A, recognizing it, making sure it's not something worse. And the rest of it comes down to preventing that person infecting other people. So hand hygiene, not sharing towels, that sort of common sense stuff. And then, um, and then comfort. So you're trying to minimize their symptoms. You're not gonna get rid of it. So I tell people it's gonna get worse before it gets better. It, it's probably gonna affect your other eye if it hasn't already. Use artificial tears, don't affect anyone else. Simple analgesia if you need it. Things like cool compressors on the eyes and then just time. Uh, if someone's getting what you think is recurrent viral conjunctivitis, something's up. It's probably not viral conjunctivitis. So th they're the ones we need to think about referring. So what about bacterial conjunctivitis? These pictures are a bit more exciting. Uh, bacterial conjunctivitis tends to cause more discharge. The one in to your top right is gonorrhea. So gonorrhea is the most purulent con con cause of conjunctivitis. You know, it literally just pours with pus. It's pretty uncommon. Uh, the one below, very uncommon. I think maybe I've seen two in my career. Um, and there'll be a history that precedes it, unprotected sex. Uh, chlamydial conjunctivitis, also uncommon. I'm just mentioning those two straight up because they can be treated with oral antibiotics, but they're definitely uncommon. Chlamydial conjunctivitis, I've probably seen five in the last several years. So uh, again, you're looking for a history of, often it's a chronic red eye. So if your normal viral conjunctivitis gets better in two weeks, these ones don't. They just kind of linger on. Um, so in those situations, take a history. Often it's a young, sexually active person, red eye for over two weeks, doesn't always become bilateral. Um, but your more common causes of bacterial conjunctivitis are your streps, staphs, haemophilus, uh, you know, the commensal flora around the eye or the upper respiratory tract. And these ones you can treat with um, topical antibiotics. So uh, chloramphenicol, does this work? No. Chloramphenicol is uh, the most common antibiotic that we use. If you're thinking of using a stronger antibiotic than chloramphenicol, you probably need to ref get them to see an ophthalmologist if it's severe enough that you're thinking that chlor chloramphenicol hasn't worked or, or there's something else going on. Um, with gonorrhea and chlamydia, you can do a dry swab for a, for a PCR. That's for chlamydia. For um, uh, gonorrhea, you can do an MCNS. So take a swab, send that off to MCNS and uh, treat them if they come back positive. But again, as I say, very uncommon. I actually can't remember the last um, bacterial conjunctivitis that I saw. So allergic conjunctivitis, does anyone have allergic eye disease? Yeah, do you need tablets for it or, or drops? Just drops. Does it stir up at a particular time of year? Spring, yeah, so it's, and you get hay fever symptoms? Everyone's medical history is coming out, it's great. No confidentiality in here. Um, yeah, so that's a typical story, okay? So the history is your clue there. So when it comes to your exam, guys, everyone perks up when you say exam. Um, 
most of, I mean, all the clues will be in the little stem that we give you guys. But try and think of these conditions as how would you, how would you uh, structure the stem for allergic conjunctivitis? Uh, here's a 25-year-old medical student who gets hay fever symptoms in spring, uses, I don't know, Nasonex or something for allergic rhinitis, and they now have red eyes with slightly blurred vision. So, you know, there's your allergic conjunctivitis stem. Uh, most of them can be treated with drops. Um, can use uh, oral antihistamines as well if they have systemic symptoms. Um, so there are topical antihistamines. Again, if topical antihistamines don't do it and you're thinking about steroid drops, often that's the thing that we escalate to, is a topical steroid eye drop, then that person needs to see an ophthalmologist because steroid drops have their own side effect profile. They can cause cataracts and raise the pressure in the eye. And both of those things are not symptomatic initially. So someone with a slit note needs to see the patient. So allergic conjunctivitis, definitely common. Bilateral, more common in springtime and summer. Okay, episcleritis is a reasonably common cause of red eye. Episcleritis is always, the way it's always framed in a question and in real life, it puts you in a, a situation where you've got to differentiate it from scleritis, okay? So there's episcleritis and scleritis. So does anyone know how to, what the sort of key differentiating thing is between those two? Have you even heard of those words before? I don't blame you if you haven't, no. <laughs> That's fine. So episcleritis is, there's a layer of tissue under the conjunctiva called the episclera, and under that is the thick connective tissue fibrous ball of the eye, which is the sclera, okay? So you've got conjunctiva, episclera, and then sclera. Episcleritis is inflammation of the episclera, and it tends to be really well localized. So if you have a look at these two pictures, the redness is localized to a wedge in the temporal aspect of the eye. It isn't always temporal, it can be nasal or, or wherever, but that's one of the things that differentiates it is a sharp delineation, okay? Scleritis tends to be more diffuse. The other thing that differentiates it is the pain and discomfort. So episcleritis, uncomfortable. Scleritis, painful enough to affect sleep. Okay, so fair bit of difference. Episcleritis, press on it, doesn't necessarily hurt that much. Scleritis, patient won't let you press on the eye or, you know, jump off the chair sort of thing. Both of them can have underlying autoimmune or rheumatological associations. So you need to think about those if you're suspecting either one of these conditions, okay? And um, uh, episcleritis is going to need topical steroids, so that's, that's a referral. Uh, and oral non-steroids can help as well. Okay. So how would you differentiate that from conjunctivitis? Does anyone want to have a... from what you can see? So episcleritis doesn't tend to discharge. Viral conjunctivitis tends to come with a prodrome, often an upper respiratory tract infection. Um, viral conjunctivitis tends to be more bilateral. Episcleritis tends to be unilateral. And um, also with viral conjunctivitis, you, you don't get sectoral redness of the eye. You don't get a sector. You get pretty much the whole eye gets affected. And even the eyelids... Often, often the eyelids become red and puffy. So there's some of the ways you can start to differentiate some of these conditions. The management's quite different, so it is important to, to get it right. Now the picture on your right is more useful. If that picture looks really painful to you, it's because it is. So scleritis is, is, is really painful. Similar to episcleritis, we go looking for underlying autoimmune, rheumatological, associations, infective associations as well. 
So you've got to think about those. Drops is not going to improve this on its own. So we'll use drops, but we'll also use an oral non-steroidals. Sometimes you've got to escalate that to steroids, a short course of prednisolone. And very occasionally, uh, steroid sparing agents, if it looks like they're going to need treatment for the longer term. Okay? So scleritis can affect the front of the eye or the back of the eye. Scleritis can definitely be a site-threatening condition. So it can cause uh, an optic neuropathy. It can cause swelling at the back of the eye, macular edema. Um, so your f the hallmark here really is pain. Deep, boring, I don't mean like boring yawn, I'm falling asleep. I mean like it's drilling into your head kind of pain. Throbbing sensation. The severity of the pain with scleritis, you need to differentiate it from acute angloclosal glaucoma. Now, is that video online yet? Have you guys seen it or not? Not yet. Okay. Does, has anyone heard of acute angloclosal glaucoma? Mainly shakes. Okay. So you'll see it in the video, but uh, in a nutshell, angloclosal glaucoma is very high pressure in the eye pressure going up because the outflow of fluid from inside the eye is impaired. So normal pressure is, is what? Does anyone know? So the, the unit is millimeters of mercury. That's the... How did you know that? It's pretty good. How did you know it? Seriously, I'm curious. Oh, you cheated. Okay, all right. You've been in clinic already. No, that's good, though. You, re you remembered. That's really good. Yeah, so if normal is 10 to 20, then angle closure can go up to unrecordable. Okay, and the eye starts to hurt around 40 to 50. Unrecordable means over 70. So that's the hallmark difference. Angle closure is severe pain, high pressure. Scleritis pressure, you know, is not really an issue. It's not a pressure problem inflammation of the wall of the eye so this is the take-home thing from this is think about underlying systemic disorders and management we've talked about pterygium very common anyone have a pterygium i saw a guy today with a pterygium in clinic right before i came here so pterygium is common in australia common in a country like australia because we're outdoors a lot there's a lot of uv so some people call it surfer's eye, people who surf, um, getting UV from the atmosphere and bouncing off the waves. So pterygium is a growth of tissue that you can see, a little fibrovascular growth, often on the nasal side of the eye. Not many things look like a pterygium. So in most cases or many cases, this should be a spot diagnosis. And... Um, um, often they can be managed conservatively. You don't have to operate on them. But we operate on them if, a few reasons. One, if, like the image on the right, it's actually growing across the whole eye. So it starts to impair vision. These days in Australia, that's not so common. The only time or, or the common place you see that these days is in remote Aboriginal communities where people haven't had their eyes checked in years or their threshold for seeing a doctor is much higher than, you know, mine or yours. Um, so growth across the visual axis, that's a reason to refer for surgery. Another reason is people just don't like the look of them. I don't like this lump on my eye. I want to get rid of it. Fair enough. Another reason is redness and irritation, so discomfort. So we operate on people who have that. Saw a young guy this morning who is uncomfortable, wants to get rid of it. Another thing is the presence of the pterygium. If you imagine that growth like a tether on the eyeball, you know, it's a band of connective tissue. So it does exert a bit of tractional force on the front of the eye. And you, if you did high school physics, you might remember from optics that the, the way light is bent or refracted, the ability of a surface to, refra to refract light is based on the curvature of the surface. And our ability to see clearly is based on light being curved precisely so that it converges on a pinpoint at the back of our eye, on the retina. 
right? And that's to do with the curvature of the front of the eye. A big part of it is to do with the curvature of the cornea. So the reason I wear glasses is because the curvature of my cornea is stuffed and my eyeball is too long. So the glasses help to bend the light in the way that my eye alone doesn't, right? That's why we wear specs. Pterygiums have the same effect. So by yanking on the front of the eye, they change the curvature. And as a result, the refractive power of the eye changes. The person starts to lose vision over time. So that's another reason to, to perform pterygium surgery. Most pterygiums these days probably don't need to be operated on. As much as I love operating, um, most of them can be managed with lubricating eye drops. So drops and ointment. But if you have any of those other things happening, then sure, you can send them on. Think about surgery. The other situation is if it doesn't look typical for a pterygium. So if it doesn't look like that typical triangular fibrovascular growth, if it looks lumpy and bumpy or you're just a bit unsure, you can get uh, tumours on the surface of the eye. So ocular surface squamous neoplasia is one of the more common ones. So any doubt about that, then have a low threshold for um, uh, referring those on. Okay, what have we got next? Subconch hemorrhage. Anyone had a subconch hemorrhage? These are super common. Yep. Did it hurt? No. They're often not painful, but sometimes they are. My first night of encore ever in ophthalmology was in 2006. And uh, so obviously I was pretty inexperienced. And the person on the phone sold a subconch hemorrhage to me as giant cell arteritis. Have you guys ever heard of giant cell arteritis? Or okay, so... That's like a life-threatening condition, potentially, whereas the subconscious hemorrhage in most cases is, is nothing. But um, anyway, I went in and saw the patient. It was fine. Um, does anyone want to be an ophthalmologist here? Any budding ophthalmologists? <laughs> One guy up the back. Do you guys get, is there like a myth still out there that you can't get into ophthalmology, it's too hard? Yeah. <laughs> well, I got in, so you can't. <laughs> can't be that hard <laughs> uh, no everything's everything's competitive so ophthalmology is no different so if you're interested go for it that's that's my advice don't be put off by the by the naysayers there used to be a myth that you have to have a PhD or a master's that's rubbish you don't I did but um <laughs> 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 but but I did because I say I did because I was genuinely interested in the subject, which was to do with global eye health and outreach. You know, I'm talking about Aboriginal people, remote communities. That's one, that's one of my interests. So I wanted to study that anyway. So if you find something that you're passionate about, master's degree is one year, big deal. Anyway, going way off track. Um, if you're ever on call in any specialty, in, in the early years, I'll, in the early phase, I would say see more than you think you need to see because then you get really good at discerning. Over time, you get really good at discerning what's really urgent and what isn't. Hesson's life advice. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so subconscious hemorrhage, common most of the time, innocuous, um, unless it's recurrent. So unless it's recurrent or there's a history of trauma, it's really reassurance lubricating eye drops, come back in 10 days, it should have done. It's a bruise around the eye, so it behaves like a bruise, takes about two weeks to go away. Um, if there's a history of trauma, if it's happening again and again, if the person's on an antiplatelet, um, or you're worried about their platelets or their INR, then think twice, but otherwise they look horrible, but they, they're not, most of the time they're not. Uh, I had one lady who had been in a domestic violence uh, incident. Someone had thrown a cup or a saucer. It had smashed. She had a red eye. No pain. Uh, examined her, and she had a little bit of porcelain or ceramic, whatever the teacup was, inside the eyeball. So it had cut straight into the globe, gone into the vitreous in the back, and just sitting there. So she ended up needing surgery. So. You know, if there is a history of trauma, what you can do is put some topical anesthetic on the eye and in the area of the hemorrhage, use a cotton bud so the eye is numb. Just use a cotton bud to move the conjunctiva around. Conjunctiva is pretty mobile usually. And you're looking for an underlying laceration 
or you're looking for a little bit of vitreous, looks like clear jelly, kind of prolapsing out of the eye, or even uveal tissue, which is pigmented, so brownish looking tissue poking out of the eye where it shouldn't belong. If you're worried about trauma, do those things and obviously call one of us. Otherwise, reassurance. Okay, dry eye. If you ever do eyes, go out the back. This will become the bane of your existence because you can't get rid of dry eyes. You pretty much can't get rid of them. Most people develop some degree of dry eye once they get to about age, age 50 or older. And the commonest cause is that on your eyelids, you have these things called meibomian glands, which secrete a sort of waxy secretion, which covers the watery tear film. So you know like an oil slick on water prevents the water from evaporating? Same thing on the surface of the eye. The lipid that your, your eyelids produce protects the water, the tear film from evaporating. Once you get to about age 50, that lipid production goes down and those meibomian glands get blocked. So oftentimes then the tears can evaporate really quickly. The eye becomes dry and gritty. It only takes about 10 seconds for an eye to start to dry out. And it's incredibly uncomfortable, worse than you think. Um, so these people need lubricating eye drops. There's, there's really no way around that. And, um, and sometimes ointment, ointment at night time as well. Because the, tear, because the surface of the eyes goes dry and the eyelids can't produce more lipid, instead the lacrimal gland overcompensates and produces too much water. Okay? So the tear film has three layers. There's a mucus layer, a water layer, and a lipid layer. So I can't do anything about the lipid layer, so the eye produces too much water. So paradoxically, dry eye patients ha can have watery eyes as well. So they come in with a red watery eye, chronic, low-level grumbling sort of thing. It's really common. GPs see a lot of this. So if you're going to be a GP, you'll be seeing this. There's lots of topical lubricating drops over the counter. Basically start with one of them. And if that plus an ointment is not doing the job, then send them on to us. There's various things that we can do, such as using topical cyclosporin occasionally. Um, autologous serum drops means you take six vials of blood from a patient, spin it down, take the serum, and that's incredibly effective at, at treating dry eye um, because of some of the immunoglobulins and enzymes that it, that's contained in the serum. It's pretty amazing. Sometimes also dry eye is due to the eyelids not being in the right position. So um, sometimes they need a very small procedure. That, that's another reason for referring. Okay, any questions about any of that so far? You guys hanging in there? I think long lectures are amazingly boring. Don't you? Like it doesn't matter who the speaker is. It's hard to avoid though. I've tried to make this as concise as possible and it's still pretty long. So um, we're up to condition number eight. There's 22 conditions. So we're over a third of the way. Hang in there. Eyelid. So anyone heard of blepharitis? Have you ever heard of that word? Yes. You know you get gingivitis in the mouth, the gums around the teeth? This is like the gingivitis of the eyes, okay? So it's inflammation, sometimes infection, but usually just inflammation on the eyelid margins where the eyelashes sprout out. And it can be contributed to by a mite. There's a little mite that can live on the surface on the eyelid margins called demodex, D-E-M-O-D-E-X, demodex mite, which kind of feeds on all the little dandruff that there is around the eyelashes, and that irritates the hell out of the eyelid margin. Blepharitis and dry eye go together. So a very common combination. So you see the, your, the picture on your left? That's a pretty severe case of blepharitis. Big, crusty blobs. It's often not as pronounced as that. But if you look closely with an ophthalmoscope or just a torch, Often you can see a little crusty buildup on the eyelashes of your dry eye patient. Okay, so the treatment for this is to clean the eyelash 
margin. So, so I say it's like removing eyeliner. Um, that's where you want to be scrubbing with a cotton tip. And you can dip the cotton tip in boiled water with bicarb soda. Sounds weird, but it works. Or boiled water and baby shampoo. So Johnson & Johnson do a baby shampoo. There's probably other brands. Um, to really scrub that eyelash margin, reduce the, the um, bacterial count on the eyelash margin and reduce the inflammation. There is a commercially available eyelid scrubbing foam, which is called Sterilid, S-T-E-R-I lid, Sterilid. And that's that little foam that people use to like brush their eyes, basically. So lid scrubs is what we call that, lid scrubs for blepharitis. Lid scrubs are often combined with artificial tears or lubricating drops because the dry eye and this go hand in hand. The blepharitis inflames the meibomian glands so they can't produce as much liquid. So that, that's, that's where the, the overlap is. Super common, very annoying, h hard to get rid of, just a chronic um, problem for many, many patients. Has anyone had a Calasian or people call this a sty out there in the community yet? Uh, you guys have started your GP terms, right? Not yet? Some have, okay. Yeah, you'll see some of this stuff. In, this is the stuff that often turns up to GPs. So Calasian often gets confused um, for an infection. It isn't. It's a, it's a focal, it's a localized inflammation. So it's one of those meibomian glands that I keep talking about that becomes blocked, that meibomian secretion builds up and causes a swelling and the local tissue doesn't like that and becomes inflamed. You can get a secondary cellulitis sometimes, that's not common. Usually it's just inflammation. Uh, so, so this is pretty common, GPs all the time, sometimes emergency departments, often they come and see us. Um, whether it's for the appearance, discomfort, or it's affecting their vision because the lid's starting to droop. When they're hot, like by hot, I mean acutely inflamed, like the one on your left, we don't tend to touch those. We wait until the inflammation goes down. That can take as long as six weeks. So often the, the first advice to these patients is give it time. And because it's a meibomian gland problem, uh, heat can work sometimes. You've basically got blocked up lipids like candle wax. You wanna heat it up and get it moving. So a hand towel, under hot water or a, or a damp hand towel in the microwave, 30 seconds, or a spoon dipped in hot water, take it out. Be really careful because the eyelid skin is some of the thinnest skin in the body. It's very easy to burn it, so you don't want to stick a hot spoon on in your eye. Um, but a bit of heat is good, and a bit of massage is good as well to try and get that meibomian secretion moving. Um, if someone's having recurrent chalasia, Fish oil tablets have been shown in some studies to have an effect on loosening up my bromine gland, gland secretion. If it's really bad, we'll use something like doxycycline or minocycline. They can be effective in treating these guys, especially if they have rosacea or something else. Um, but again, if it's getting to that point, they probably need to see one of us. Uh, other things can look like a chalasian. So, um, you know, neoplasms, tumours of the eyelid, can look a little bit like a chalasian as well. So always have that in the back of your mind. The most common tumours are basal cell carcinoma on the eyelid margin. Uh, they, they do look pretty different to this, but still have it in the back of your mind as a cause of a weird lid lump, especially if it doesn't go away. Uh, if after six weeks it's still lumpy, then yeah, we cut them, we flip the eyelid, anaesthetise it obviously, in size over where the chalasian is and then scoop out the contents. It's very satisfying when you've got a big chalasian. It's like popping a massive pimple. And uh, I had one Aboriginal lady where delivering the chalasian, it was like delivering a small baby. It was disgusting and beautiful at the same time. <laughs> so uh, another reason to do ophthalmology. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, so you've got chalasian, which some people call a sty. 
Then you've got this thing, which some people call a sty. So a chalazion is a m blocked meibomian gland. It's also known as an internal hordolium. What a weird name that is. Internal, because the meibomian glands are internal relative to the eyelashes. So you've got eyelashes, and behind them, you've got the meibomian glands, okay? An external hordolium, which is what this is, is an infected eyelash follicle, okay? So it looks similar, can look similar to a chalazion, but different etiology, different location, different treatment, okay? These tend to be more painful, so more focally tender, and sometimes you can see a little collection of pus around, a, 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 around the lash follicle. Treatment for this is pull the lash out. So if you really think it's centered around the base of an eyelash, just pluck out the lash, warn the patient that you're gonna do that. And sometimes you'll be able to express a little bit of pus just from that little follicle um, with the lash pulled out. You can use topical antibiotic for these uh, if they're draining. If they're not draining, don't cut them. Cutting the eyelid externally can create a scar, which then contracts and changes the eyelid margin, and that can lead to dry eye, you know, watery eye and, and, and other things. Um, so pluck, topical antibiotic, you can use system, you know, oral antibiotics, cephalexin or dentin, something that covers the gland positives. Uh, and I haven't seen one that hasn't responded to those things. The thing to watch for with these, the, an external hordolium, is if it's close to the nose, okay, so if it's on the nasal side and it's quite big and red, you've got to differentiate it from a dacrocystitis. So dacrocystitis is infection of the tear drainage system, which is on the nasal side of the eye, involves an infection of the lacrimal sac. Dacrocystitis can be dangerous, okay? So I won't talk about it any more than that. It's in the other lecture. But when you think about an external hordolium, also think about dacrocystitis. Could this be that? Usually it isn't. I'm just ignoring the words now. You can read those later. Um, okay, so this is the most uh, common. Um, uh, this is the most common tumor of the eyelid. Okay, as in non-benign. Okay, um, and the one on your right, your left, I should say, is very typical appearance. So it's kind of undulated. People describe it as looking pearly, like a pearl. I don't know where that comes from. Um, but it looks like that. Irregular. The eyelid margin, which is normally curved, you can have a little dimple in it or a little depression, so it's loss of the normal eyelid margin. can be covered with little telangiectetic blood vessels. They can bleed sometimes, and they can be a bit painful. Uh, they tend to be slowly growing. Um, and in theory, they are benign, but if you get invasive BCC, that's, that's not benign. So any suspicion of a BCC, an, eye, an eyelid margin is a very common place. I mean, you can get BCCs anywhere, obviously. Dermatologists see them all the time. But any suspicion of an irregular-looking lump on the eyelid margin that's not necessarily red and acute and inflamed, then think BCC. That's a more common thing. SCCs are less common and more aggressive. Uh, but you're going to treat them both the same way anyway. Here's a lump that I'm not comfortable with. Don't mess around, you know, refer on to an ophthalmologist. Um, pain and bleeding are uh, two things to watch out for. If it's on, on the nasal aspect of the eye again, they can penetrate backwards into the orbit and beyond. So they need an urgent referral. Try and get those guys seen as, you know, as soon as possible. Thankfully, pretty uncommon. These guys are going to need surgery. So sometimes they'll do a biopsy and then operate. Sometimes they'll just have an excision. And the margins will get sent to his histopathologist, make sure we clear the margin, usual kind of stuff. They don't normally need much more than that. Uh, that's the standard treatment. And there are various surgical techniques for get getting rid of a BCC that you don't, you don't really need to know about. Depends where they are. Okay, so that's eyelids. So we're up to... We're over halfway. Oh my god! Um, has anyone heard of this condition? Age-related macular degeneration. 
do you know the two, broadly speaking, two different types of macular degeneration? Yeah? What are they? Wet and dry, yeah? Do you know what that means? Very good. How did you know that? Okay. Just general knowledge. Pretty good. All right. Impressed. Um, I saw a lady today presenting for the first time with wet macular degeneration. So wet macular degeneration is the one that tends to cause acute visual loss or acute distortion. So straight lines looking wavy. And it's central, yeah? So it's a central scotoma or a central distortion. It's not like a stroke where you have a quadrantinopia or a hemianopia. Um, dry macular degeneration is different. It's not an acute thing. It's a slowly progressive thing. Often people don't even know that they have it. What they notice is when they go from light to a dark room, they don't adapt as quickly. That's one of the first symptoms of dry macular degeneration. Or they might also talk about distortion, but that distortion Distortion means straight line looking wavy. Uh, it's not an overnight thing. With m wet macular degeneration, it is an overnight thing. But with dry, it's chronic. Those yellow dots that you can see at the back of the eye, they're called drusen, okay? Drusen are the hallmark of dry macular degeneration. They're little collections of lipoprotein at the back of the eye that's not being pumped out in the back of the retina through the back door as it should be, because that a pumping mechanism is impaired. So there's a layer of cells which supports the retina called the pigment epithelium. So dry macular degeneration is thought of primarily as a dysfunction of retinal pigment epithelium, leads to drusen, leads to distortion, and sometimes leads to wet macular degeneration, which is a more advanced type of macular degeneration. Um, what can you do for dry macular degeneration? You can slow its progression in order to try and prevent it advancing to, the, to, to worse stages of macular degeneration, okay? To worse stages. So how do you slow its progression? It's kind of common sense, good lifestyle stuff. So smoking is a big modifiable risk factor. UV is a modifiable risk factor, so good sunnies. With sunnies, by the way, you sort of get what you pay for, guys, just for your own interest. So you want polarized sunglasses. They tend to be 200 bucks plus, unfortunately. Um, but they're the ones that are usually good at preventing UV exposure. Um, what else? Antioxidants. So dietary sources of, an uh, uh, dietary sources of antioxidants. And the kind of minerals and vitamins that are contained in colorful fruit and vegetable. So I'm kind of describing a healthy diet, basically. Low cholesterol and some physical exercise, like hello, it's good for everything, including macular health. Those green leafy vegetables in particular contain some pigments which are probably protective of the macula. So if you eat green stuff, it'll, it'll you know, possibly slow down the progression of macular degeneration. Um, there are supplements out there on the market for macular health that have been shown in some clinical tri trials to slow the progression of dry macular degeneration. I tell people if they can get it from their diet, get it from their diet, the absorption's better. With supplements, you end up peeing most of it out. And uh, supplements are expensive, and it's good to have a good diet anyway. So. The best evidence is for the Mediterranean diet. Has anyone heard of that? Mediterranean diet is basically what I described, which is largely fresh fruit and veggies, lean meats, fish, some nuts, legumes, red wine, dark chocolate. It's pretty good. It's like a great dinner. So um, that's as effective as these supplements. When you look at how they slow the rates of dry macular degeneration. So see if you can encourage people to do that, stop smoking. Uh, what about glaucoma? This is a mystery to many people. Uh, 
we still don't completely understand the mechanism of glaucoma. The most common answer, I, what's glaucoma? People say high pressure in the eye. S high pressure is pretty much the only modifiable risk factor for the type of glaucoma where there is high pressure. So hypertensive glaucoma. So you can have normotensive glaucoma, glaucoma without high pressure. And the definition of, and you can have high pressure without glaucoma. So the definition of glaucoma is a chronic progressive optic neuropathy. Bilateral, can be asymmetric. Um, that's, this is the most common form of glaucoma that I'm talking about, which is open angle glaucoma. Closed angle glaucoma is in the other talk, so you can, uh, and I've mentioned it before. So, what is the angle? Does anyone even know? Open angle, closed angle? Any anatomy experts in the room? The guy who went to eye clinic last week, whenever? No? No angles? Okay. Um, so the angle is in the anterior chamber, the front part of the eye. So y the eye is split up very simply into a front bit and a back bit. Front room, back room. The front room is the anterior chamber, so the cornea is at the front and the iris is at the back. And aqueous humor, fluid, which gets produced in the eye, drains out of the anterior chamber. Okay, So the angle is the space between the cornea and the iris. It's a little wedge-shaped space between the cornea and the iris. There's a structure there which acts like a drain. It's called the trabecular meshwork. Trabecular meshwork is where aqueous humor exits the eye. And glaucoma may be an abnormality of the trabecular meshwork. Hence, fluid that doesn't get pumped out, pressure goes up, somehow that leads to problems with the optic nerve, glaucoma. On examination, the sort of hallmark of glaucoma is an increased cup to disc ratio. Okay, so we can talk more about this in your workshop on Friday, but if you look at the image on your right, uh, your left, I should say, um, that's a normal cup size. The cup is the bright yellow bit in the center of the optic nerve. So there's an absence of nerve tissue there. It's like a little depression or dimple in the head of the optic nerve, okay? And in glaucoma, you lose more neurons. You lose more nerve tissue. So as a result, that little hole or that little dimple increases in size. Therefore, your cup gets larger relative to your optic disc or optic nerve. So we call that a high cup to disc ratio. So normal cup to disc ratio is about 0 0.3, 0 0.5. So the cup is up to half the diameter of the disc or the nerve. Um, above 0.5, you've got to start thinking, is this abnormal? Okay. Have I completely lost everyone with that description of cups and nerves and discs? <laughs> I, don't, I don't blame you if I have. Um, it's a lot to take in. But in summary, glaucoma, commonest optic neuropathy, okay? It's actually the leading irreversible cause of blindness in the world. The most common form is open angle, not closed angle, open angle, which is not symptomatic. It's a, it's a silent disease and it causes tunnel vision. So if you're at the point where you're symptomatic from tunnel vision, you've lost most of your vision. That's very advanced glaucoma. In Australia, thankfully, we're pretty good at screening people. And you want to screen people who have a family history of glaucoma. So if someone has a definite family history of glaucoma from age 40 onwards or thereabouts, they want to be seeing someone, whether it's an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, to get their eyes checked for glaucoma. So a bit more on primary open angle glaucoma, I'll, I'll let you guys um, read up on that. But essentially the treatment is to lower the intraocular pressure as much as possible because as I say, that's the one modifiable risk factor. Another couple of risk factors which do come up occasionally in the literature, um, obesity, 
and obstructive sleep apnea, which often tend to go together. So they may raise the CSF pressure around the head of the optic nerve, not really sure. But the main modifiable one is the pressure in the eye. How do you get the pressure in the eye down? There are topical eye drops. There's four different classes of them, which work in different ways to get the pressure down. Okay. So particularly in those patients that have high pressure glaucoma, you need to get the pressure down into the normal range. Where you'll come across this most commonly, if you're not an ophthalmologist, is as another doctor seeing a patient who's on a funny eye drop that you've never heard of. And if they've been on it for a long time, chances are it's a pressure lowering drop. The key thing there is to recognize that it's a glaucoma drop, ask the patient, uh, or look for correspondence from us. And um, often, and you can re-prescribe it. If they've been on it for a long time, they've run out of a script, there's no problem with the GP re-prescribing that, as long as the patient continues to see an ophthalmologist. Um, often patients, when they finish their bottle or they finish their script, they just forget to carry on. And glaucoma is a lifelong condition. They need to be treated forever. If drops don't work, then there are different types of laser treatment that we can perform for glaucoma and or surgery. So earlier I talked about the trabecular mesh work, which is an outflow mechanism, a drain that's not working. So we can create drains in the eye using different surgical techniques to pump the fluid out. So just remember drops, laser, and surgery. If they're on drops, continue them. Um, and make sure they're seeing an ophthalmologist because glaucoma can progress, and as I say, it's a silent disease. Okay, cataracts. Cataract is still the leading avoidable cause of blindness on planet Earth. Um, it will be replaced by diabetic retinopathy in the future, mainly because cataracts are treatable. And especially China and India are amazing at doing high volume cataract surgery. So tens of thousands of people a day getting operated on in those countries. So they have these incredibly efficient factories, basically, where people are getting safe and effective cataract surgery, very, very high turnover. So they're curing blindness, bang, 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 bang. Blind people come in, sighted people go out. Um, we do pretty well in Australia. Australia, we've got one of the highest cataract surgical rates in, in the developed world. But China and India, it's just a different ball game. So what symptoms does cataract cause? Does anyone? Sudden or, or, or slow? Slow, yeah. So a typical thing is patient will come in Oh, doctor, um, my vision's blurry. I thought my glasses were foggy. I wipe my glasses and it's still blurry. Okay, so it's a general sort of fogginess. Another common symptom is I don't like driving at nighttime anymore. Oh, why not? Oncoming headlights give me a lot of glare. So glare from oncoming headlights. So I saw a lady recently who is a part of a choir. She can no longer drive to her choir practice because rehearsals at night time. So I did cataract surgery for her so she can continue enjoying her life, basically. So pretty much everyone gets a cataract um, from age 60 onwards. The average age of getting cataract surgery is in the 70s um, in uh, developed countries. Uh, and slowly progressive, bilateral, can be asymmetric. Um, there are other causes of cataract. So if anyone's been hit in the eye hard enough, you can get a traumatic cataract. But they tend to be much more rapid in onset. And it's unilateral, it's in the eye that's hit, okay? Steroid medications can cause rapid onset cataract. So if someone's taking oral prednisolone for an extended period of time, can certainly cause bad cataract. Can be born with cataract. So that's your kid with an absent red reflex. So you've got to check the red reflex there. And any surgery inside the eye can speed up cataract progression as well. Um, so when do you refer someone for cataract surgery? When it's affecting their life is the short answer. And a good sort of benchmark for that is the driving standard, which in Australia 
is for a private driver's license, you have to see at least 6 over 12 in the better eye. Okay? So the worse eye can see worse than that, but one eye has to see 6 over 12. That's for a private driver's license. Commercial driver's license or heavy vehicle is more stringent. Good eye needs to see 6 over 9. The bad eye can't see worse than 6 over 18. Okay? And those guidelines will be important to you if you're a GP or any doctor because patients might come in and you may need to help them with their driver's license renewal forms, which we do all the time. So 612 better eye, private. 6.9 better eye, no worse than 6.18, worse eye uh, for commercial or, or heavy goods. Do you guys remember the nomenclature for expressing visual acuity? 6 over this and 6 over that? Yeah, some of you. There is, uh, there should be a video available on how to measure visual acuity that if, ha have you guys seen that? Is, that? is that on your LMS? Has anyone seen that yet? Not yet. Okay should be on there. I'll make sure after the talk today that it's available before you come to your workshop on Friday. Useful to have a look at that before you come because then it'll make that part of the workshop easier for you. Okay, refractive error. So everyone here who's wearing glasses or, or contact lenses will have um, some refractive error. Often people say refractory error, but refractory means like short-lived, like a, like a quick mistake, refractory error, but refractive error is, it is the expression for people who need specs or, or contact lenses. So broadly speaking, you're long-sighted or short-sighted. I'm short-sighted. Short-sighted means I can see up close, can't see in the distance. And uh, short-sighted people tend to have a long eyeball, okay? So short-sightedness is myopia, myopia, long eyeball. So remember the light bends to a little pinpoint in a long eyeball myopic person like me that pinpoint comes to a focus in front of the retina which is the top image there okay in front of the retina and um, you need a concave lens in order to correct that right with a long-sighted eye long-sighted can see in the distance can't see up close hyperopia the focal point where the light comes to a focus is behind the retina eyeballs too short Okay, and those people need the opposite in order to correct the in order to correct the refractive error. Have you guys heard of astigmatism? Have you heard that word? What astigmatism means is, so in myopia and hyperopia, you can be long or short-sighted, but the curvature of the front of the eye can still be more or less spherical, like a like a soccer ball. Astigmatism means the curvature of the front of the eye is no longer like a soccer ball, it's more like a footy, a football. So it's not a regular round sphere. And that creates distortion uh, because the light beams no longer can be refracted to go in the same direction, Ooh. in the same direction. They sort of get refracted in oblique directions to each other. So it creates a blurred effect. So pe you can have myopia with astigmatism, you can have hypo hyperopia with astigmatism. They need special lenses whether it's spectacle lenses like mine. I've got a bit of astigmatism, not much. Um, and if you do cataract surgery on, the, on these people, these days you can put a lens in the eye which corrects the myopia or hyperopia and can correct the astigmatism by putting in a special lens on the correct angle to uh, compensate for that football-shaped front of the eye. So essentially it's all treatable. Um, Refractive error is super common. There was a national survey of eyes done in Australia in 2016. Unbelievably, this was the leading cause of low vision in Australia. So huge numbers of people walking around just don't have the specs they need for whatever, for whatever reason. And often the reason is expense because good specs aren't cheap. So there is possibly a spectacle subsidy scheme just for your interest that's being talked about, which will probably be for Indigenous Australians and possibly others who, who have concessionary entitlements to get subsidised spectacles. It hasn't been rolled out yet, but government's committed the money, so let's see what happens. 
So that, that just summarises what I was talking about. Now, this kid, if I'm asking this kid to look straight ahead, which eye is the abnormal eye? They've got a target in front of them. So first of all, is this normal or abnormal? I've kind of given that away, yeah. So which is the abnormal eye? Yeah, yeah their left. Why? What's the obvious abnormality? Say that again. Yeah, yeah, the whole eye is, the whole eye is kind of turned inwards towards the nose, all right? So we call that an esotropia. Tropia means misdirection. Eso means towards the nose. Exo means away from the nose. So this little boy has a left esotropia, okay? What's the cause of that? Many causes, but the most common one in this age group tends to be long-sightedness, hyperopia, okay? So when someone's hyperopic, which means they can see in the distance well, but not up close, in order to see intermediate or close objects, they have to activate their accommodation reflex. Do you, have you guys heard of the accommodation reflex? Yep. So accommodation reflex means your eyes turn in a little bit, pupil constricts, and the shape of the lens actually changes so that it can refract more so that you can focus on the thing that's close. So if you're hyperopic and you're accommodating a lot and overcompensating, one of the eyes can just turn in and stay in, or it can intermittently turn in and then turn out again. So you can have an intermittent esotropia. The clue that this should give you is the vision in the left eye, something's up with the vision in the left eye, this kid needs to be seen. The worst case scenario is, absolute worst case, very uncommon, there's a tumour in the eyeball. But in a way, you've got to treat a kid with an esotropia or an exotropia as being a tumour until proven otherwise. If that sounds pretty extreme, the easy thing you can do is just check for a red reflex right there in the room. So turn the lights down, pupils will dilate, use your ophthalmoscope, have a look for red reflex, we can practice that this Friday. Absent red reflex, still can be lots of things, could be a congenital cataract, who knows. But that needs an urgent referral. Much more common, this kid just needs glasses. And with a hyperopic correction, okay, hyperopic glasses, the eye will probably turn out, probably stay out. The other thing we do sometimes, did anyone have, did anyone have amblyopia as a kid? No one here? Okay. Um, it's pretty common. Amblyopia means the eye and the brain aren't talking together. They're not talking. So the visual input isn't adequate for the brain to control the extraocular muscles so that both eyes move and work together. If you leave amblyopia untreated for long enough, that visual deficit becomes permanent, okay? So the eye will always be weak and it will always be turned in or out. The critical age, so there's a plastic period where you can treat amblyopia and vision can come back to normal pretty much. The plastic age is probably up to about eight or nine. Some studies these days say it might extend out to 13, but really you wanna get these kids in early treat them early. Glasses, glasses alone don't do it. Have you ever seen a kid having an eye patched? Heard of that, yeah? Which eye would you patch? Yeah, you patch the good eye. So you're forcing the kid to use the bad eye and that increases the sensory input into that eye. This is called visual neglect, basically. The left eye is not being used. So the neurosensory pathway between the eye and the brain aren't developing. Visual neglect over time, past the age of eight, becomes permanent visual reduction, okay? So you wanna get the vision as sharp as possible using glasses, use patching if you need to. If they've still got an interned eye after adequate glasses and patching, then sometimes little kids need surgery, young teenagers. That tends not to go beyond that. So amblyopia is a problem of childhood, okay? And the earlier we jump onto it, the better that kid's bec vision becomes for, for the long term. What do you lose if you've only got one good eye? What's one of the visual abilities that you lose? Mm -hmm. So what does binocular vision allow you to do? 
yeah, yeah, and it's related to distance, but it's depth perception. So, so we call that stereopsis. So that's the ability of to create two images, and because you're looking at it from two different angles, you can create a depth effect. It's like having two cameras and be able to create a 3D image. That's how depth and stereopsis work. Okay, so if you've only got one, you've lost that cue. So you have to use other cues. There are what we call monocular cues of depth. One of them is things get smaller in the distance. Another one is if one thing's in front of another, you can't see the thing behind, therefore this one is closer. So you can still judge depth. It's legal to drive with one eye because of these monocular cues of depth perception. But you can't be a pilot, you can't be a microsurgeon. There are certain careers which it will stop you from doing. And also, if you've only got one good eye, if that good eye goes, you're done. Right? There goes your driver's license and many of your other activities. So anyone with amblyopia, you sort of treat as a, as a VIP. Any questions about that, guys? So strabismus and amblyopia go together, uh, can certainly go together. Um, I, did, I do talk about strabismus in that other talk, so fourth, sixth, and third nerve palsies. Uh, they often need to be treated as medical emergencies because they can be an intracranial cause. But uh, really this is just to say that uh, strabismus or squint just means a you know, wonky eye, uh, often goes with poor vision in that eye. So think about what the cause of the poor vision is from front to back. Is the cornea cloudy? Is there a big cataract? Could there be bleed or a tumour in the vitreous? Could this be an optic neuropathy? Is the retina stuffed? So they're the, they're the structures that can be damaged, right, front to back. Um, less commonly, particularly in kids, you're thinking cranial nerve palsy, which is more acute. Uh, but as I say, that's kind of a separate talk, so I don't need to go into that um, today. Um, the girl on the bottom, which is the abnormal eye? Left eye, is that? Looking upward, what causes that? Any ideas? the fourth nerve palsy, most commonly. So fourth, first, all these muscles have three actions, but one of the actions of the fourth nerve is to keep the eye down, particularly when it's turned in. But if you've got a dense fourth nerve palsy, even just looking straight ahead, the eye would drift up. So um, that's a fourth nerve palsy, that's not uncommon. With these photos, you might get one of these in your exam, the patient's always being asked to look straight ahead. So if you take the straight eye as being the normal one, the other eye is abnormal, there are three nerves that supply extraocular movement. One of them turns the eye outwards. So if the eye is in, it means that lateral pull is gone. So which nerve is that? Sixth nerve? Okay. So sixth nerve palsy, abducens palsy, eye turned in. That's what the young adult patient's got. Um, fourth nerve palsy, the eye tends to drift up, especially when it's turned in towards the nose. But when do you turn your eye in and look down in life? When are you doing this with your eyes? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we used to say reading, but these days it's the phone. No one reads anymore. <laughs> so phone or walking downstairs. So people will say, doctor, I've got vertical, they won't say I've got vertical diplopia, but they'll say I've got double vision when I'm walking down the stairs. And always ask, is it two images side by side or one on top of the other? Sometimes it's oblique, that can make it a bit tricky. But generally fourth nerve palsy will be vertical, sixth nerve palsy will be horizontal, third nerve palsy can be a little bit oblique. So a little bit vertical and, and, and a little bit horizontal. What does the eye sort of classically do in a third nerve palsy? Down and out with Daffy Duck. Did you ever see that cartoon? It's probably, you're probably too young. Anyway, that's how I remember third nerve palsies. 
So third and four, leave your eyes down and out. What else is up in the air? Have you ever even heard of Daffy Duck? Anyone? How old am I, really? <laughs> what else happens in a third no palsy? The eye. Yep, tells us. And what else? Sorry? Yeah, the drive. Yep, yep. You, yeah, you don't always get ptosis and medriasis, but you certainly can. Um, medriasis especially is an urgent thing because it's one of the more specific signs for an aneurysm compressing your third nerve. So if you're seeing a third nerve with what you think is a dilated pupil, they need neuroimaging urgently. Okay, so getting there. So some conditions cause eye signs. Does anybody know of the common ones? What are they? We've talked about one of them already. Yep. Are these super common? What else? Yeah. Migraine? Did you say? Yeah, migraine can cause symptoms but not necessarily signs. Yeah. What else? Hypertension? Have you guys had that talk yet? Hypertensive retinopathy? I'll talk about that in a moment. Are you guys aware of people getting injections into their eyes in the general community? Are you aware of this? No? Okay. Look, injections into the eyes are maybe the most common medical procedure happening in Australia at the moment. So if you are a GP, you'll definitely be seeing patients or an endocrinologist or anything, seeing people with diabetes. A big proportion of them will be having injections into the eyes. So why the hell would you inject an eye? Well, in diabetes, the most common cause of vision loss is macular edema, okay? So the macula is the, the center of the retina at the back of the eye. So the macula becomes swollen because the blood vessels are damaged, okay? So you get a swollen macula. It's a bit like having a foggy windscreen. You can't see through it properly. You've got leaky blood vessels and something that has been found to reduce leakage from damaged blood vessels is a little compound which binds a chemical called vascular endothelial growth factor, okay? Vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF. That's a cytokine. So an anti-VEGF binds with a cytokine, reduces the VEGF load in the eye. Blood vessels temporarily become less leaky macular edema gets better, okay? So if you walk across to the Lyons Eye Institute where I work, you will see scores of people every day getting their eyes injected with diabetic macular edema and scores of people getting their eyes injected for wet macular degeneration, okay? So different diseases, different mechanisms, but anti-VEGF drugs of which there are three main ones on the market at the moment. That will probably increase in time. Anti-VEGF drugs are very effective. And they've only been around for about 13, 14 years. Um, prior to that, people just went blind from macular, wet macular degeneration, went blind from diabetic eye disease. But now in many, most patients we can stabilize vision and in many patients we can improve vision. So you just really need to be aware of that. It needs to be on your radar. A, because lots of your patients will be having it done like I'm having monthly injections into my eye. And B, because there's a very small risk with every injection of an infection in the eye. So endophthalmitis, that's called. It's in the other talk. But that's a true ocular emergency because endophthalmitis rapidly blinds people if it's not treated. The incidence of endo endophthalmitis is about one every 5,000 injections. So it's pretty uncommon. I've had two in 14, 15 years, however long, and it's terrible for the patient and for you. These days, they tend to be operated on pretty quickly and they do okay, um, most of the time, as long as it's caught early. But red eye following recent intravitreal injection equals endophthalmitis until proven otherwise, okay? 
So let's just wind it back and talk about diabetic retinopathy a bit more generally. So diabetic retinopathy is a retinal vascular disorder, retinal vascular disorder. Um, diabetes causes microvascular problems, you guys all know that, retinopathy, nephropathy, and this is one of the manifestations. So the eye is no different to the rest of the body. Often this is the first place we can pick up the end organ complications of diabetes. So someone's going along thinking they've got good metabolic control, but they've got terrible diabetic eye disease. That can affect that person's systemic management. So the main risk factors, just remember three main risk factors, and they should all be intuitive. Okay, so the first one is just HbA1c. And the sort of landmark trials that we refer to, which were done a long time ago, both found an HbA1c of around seven to be the most protective for slowing the progression to more advanced diabetic eye disease. So HbA1c of seven, blood pressure control is the second one. You know, I think the Australian guidelines used to be a systolic of 140 over 80 or something like that. It's now 120 over 70. Often people are now not going to achieve that, but that's what you're aiming for. Um, and the other one is hyperlipidemia. So just remember those three for diabetic retinopathy, blood sugar, blood pressure, lipids. They're the main three modifiable risk factors. And to have the eyes screened every year. Again, diabetic eye disease can be a silent disease. You can have peripheral retina involved before the central retina is involved. So even if they're asymptomatic, it doesn't matter. They, they need to be seen. So annual examination, if they've got diabetic eye disease, more often than annual. So we often, we often talk about stages of diabetic eye disease or grades of diabetic eye disease. And for your purposes, you can think of it as four different stages. Um, or let's say five. So the first one is no diabetic eye disease. So you look in the back of the eye, it looks normal. Optic nerve, macular vessels, happy, good. See you in a year. Okay. Then you have what we call mild diabetic eye disease. So the simplest way to think about these is mild diabetic eye disease, they get little microaneurysms in the back of the eye. What does a microaneurysm look like? A little red dot. You shouldn't have little red dots in the back of the eye. They don't belong there. You can have red blood vessels. That's normal. But you shouldn't have little pinpoint red dots. If all you have is pinpoint red dots, that's mild. Okay? Now, I'm going to jump from mild to severe. Severe diabetic retinopathy follows what we call the 4-2-1 rule. Okay? 4 two, one. Oh, it's actually on the slide. Cool. Okay. So the four is more than... So you think of the eye as having quadrants. Okay. Up, down, left, right. Four quadrants of the back of the eye. Severe diabetic retinopathy. At least 20 hemorrhages in each quadrant. Okay. So that's quite a lot of blood in the back of the eye. Or something that we call venous beading. So hopefully we'll have some pictures for you. Um, I mean, these aren't close-ups, so you can't really see. Hopefully we'll have some pictures on Friday. So the veins in the eye, instead of looking like normal veins, as you'd expect them to look, they start to look like, you know, like a row of sausages where there's a pinch in between each sausage. So that's what we call venous beading. That's a sign of ischemia. So if you've got two quadrants of venous beating anywhere, automatically that person's severe. And the last thing is called an intraretinal microvascular abnormality. Do not worry about that. We won't ask you guys about that because it's quite a difficult thing to detect, even for an ophthalmologist. So just remember, lots of blood everywhere, maybe more than 20 in each quadrant. This person is at least severe. Or if the veins look very sausagey, two veins. Okay, this could be. This is at least severe. When I say at least severe, what I mean is you can get worse than severe, which is the one on the end, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. 
That means the eye is so ischemic, it's now growing its own blood vessels. So the VEGF levels, you know, I talked about VEGF earlier. VEGF has gone up so high that the eye says, stuff this. I'm not getting enough blood supply from the ophthalmic artery. I'm making my own blood vessels. The problem with those blood vessels is they're prone to leaking, bleeding, and causing traction on the retina around them. So they tear the retina off, cause a retinal detachment. So a person with proliferative diabetic retinopathy, abnormal new blood vessels, gets a vitreous hemorrhage. Have you guys heard of that? Have you? Vitreous hemorrhage, maybe. Sudden bleed inside the eye. The vitreous is the jelly in the back part of the eye. So, oh, doctor, I'm diabetic and I've suddenly lost vision in the eye. Everything looks a little bit red. That's a vitreous hemorrhage. Or suddenly lost vision with a few flashing lights, retinal detachment, right? From traction from abnormal blood vessels. So proliferative diabetic retinopathy blinds people, right? That's why they need to be seen earlier. Who rocks up with proliferative diabetic retinopathy to an eye clinic has never been seen before? What kind of patients do you think? <coughs> so lack of access to services, yep, who else? If you had to say lower middle or upper socioeconomic demographic, yeah, obviously. So it's like homeless people, poor people, people who don't have health insurance, single people, so having a partner is protective. Um, don't worry if you're single. This is later in life. Um, yeah, so they're, they're the people who turn up with blinding eyes. Often it's Aboriginal people. I see a lot of Aboriginal patients. Unfortunately, often it's Aboriginal people. Um, now, I talked about mild and I talked about severe. So mild, microaneurysms only. Severe, 4 two, one rule. Right? Everybody, everybody happy with that? Proliferative, weird, crazy, new blood vessel. Bleeding. Right? Moderate is anything that's more than mild, but less than severe. So if you have more than microaneurysms only, but you don't think you satisfy the 4 two, one rule, that's moderate. Why does this grading matter? Because it determines how frequently we see the patient, so it determines the follow-up interval. And it also, we have a threshold for when we treat people, and it's based on how rapidly they're advancing. That's one of the criteria. So if someone has gone from mild to moderate to severe in a year, they definitely need treatment into the eye. And the two main treatments, three injections, which I talked about, laser treatment and surgery. Okay, injections, laser, surgery. Talk a little bit more about those. So. I don't know how many pictures you've seen of the back of the eye, probably not many, unless you're interested in eyes. But can you guys kind of appreciate that there's a big frond, like a bush of squiggly blood vessels over the top of the optic disc, the optic nerve in that photo? So normally you should be able to see the optic nerve quite clearly. It's a round yellow ball and it's got blood vessels emanating from it and the rest of the tissue is orange. That's a normal retina. Yellow circle, red lines, orange background. That's what I look at every day. If you've got big clumps of blood vessels anyway, that's not normal. If you've got blood within the orange tissue, red things, that's not normal. If you've got yellow things within the orange tissue, that's not normal, o other than the optic disc itself. What could the yellow things within the orange tissue be? So you get lipid in diabetic retinopathy, yep, very common. What else? What's, what if you get a palish, fluffy looking, whitish yellow blob within the orange tissue in a diabetic person? There's actually one in this photo towards the bottom. Do you see that little faint white blob? So that's called a cotton wool spot. It's just another sign of ischemia. So this is what makes 
this person, oh, they're definitely not mild because they've got more than just microaneurysms, even if you didn't see that big neovascular find. Okay? They're the sorts of signs that diabetic patients can get. Whenever you're talking about diabetic eye disease, the first line when you talk about management is metabolic control of the diabetes. So before you even think about the eye, the eye is an end organ, it's part of the body. The way to treat diabetic eye disease is to treat the diabetes. Three modifiable risk factors that I talked about. Beyond that, for proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the mainstay of treatment is laser. Okay? Laser means shooting the peripheral retina, so the patient's not going to lose vision from you during that. Uh, they actually won't notice it most of the time. But ablating the peripheral retina with little shots of laser. So essentially you're killing off those ischemic parts of the retina so they don't pump out so much VEGF that I talked about earlier. And as a result, the diabetic retinopathy doesn't progress as much. How do we, who found out that shooting a laser in the eye slows down diabetic retinopathy? Does anyone know this story? It's a crazy idea. Why would you do that? Like, here's someone going blind. I'm just going to shoot a laser in their face. Pretty sure that's going to slow down the eye disease. So what happened was during the Second World War, the soldiers and, and fighters who came back with bad eye injuries where parts of the retina were killed or damaged, what they found was the diabetic soldiers who had severe eye trauma where parts of the retina were damaged, their diabetic eye disease didn't advance anymore or nowhere near as badly as everyone else. So the idea came about that if we just damage the peripheral parts of the retina, which are the more ischemic part, they're more prone to ischemia, they end up causing all these problems, then maybe that'll slow things down because it certainly has done so in these soldiers. So that's when the idea of ablating the retina peripherally came about and, and it works. We still use it now. So that's called panretinal photocoagulation. Panretinal, the whole retina. Really, it means the whole peripheral retina. Photocoagulation means you're creating a burn using light, using light energy, which is what, which is what laser is. So um, that's, the, that's the mainstay for proliferative diabetic retinopathy. You don't do that for non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Okay? So mild, moderate, severe, non-proliferative, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, new blood vessels. These guys get lasered. The non-proliferative guys tend not to get lasered. Okay? The other thing that came out of the Second World War was fighter pilots getting shot down and uh, so the cockpit would explode and the windows of the cockpit are made of perspex, which is a type of plastic, right? And so the plastic would shatter and go into the eye. And there was an ophthalmologist in the UK who noticed that the plastic in the eyeball did not cause an inflammatory reaction. So he goes, oh, this is inert. This compound when you stick it in the human eye is inert doesn't cause an inflammatory reaction. So why don't we take that plastic, shave it down, make it the shape of a lens, and take out the cataract and stick the plastic in in its place. And that was the kind of foundation of modern cataract surgery, where we remove the natural lens and stick in some plastic in its place to recreate that refractive effect. So in case you ever wondered, that's War sometimes has weirdly good spin-offs. I do not support war. Um, okay, so diabetic macular edema, I, I touched on this at the beginning. This is the one where people get injections into the eye. So we talked about the stages of diabetic retinopathy, of severity. You can have diabetic retinopathy at any stage of, sorry, diabetic macular edema at any stage of severity of diabetic retinopathy. Does that make sense? So you've got to think of them, the diabetic walk is in the room, I'm going, how severe is your retinopathy? When am I going to have to laser you? And do you have diabetic macular edema? Am I going to have to inject you? Okay? So severity 
And presence or absence of diabetic macroedema is a simple way to think about diabetic eye disease plus the systemic control. Um, as I said, anti-VEGF medications is what we inject into the eye. There are also steroid preparations because there's a role of, there's, a, there's an element of inflammation, a big element of inflammation with diabetic macroedema. So diabetic patient, diabetic macular edema needs injections of anti-VEGF agents and or steroids into the eye. There is a different type of laser that we use sometimes as an adjunct to those things. But broadly speaking, that's your, that's your approach to thinking about vision loss from diabetic eye disease. Big, big topic, diabetic eye disease, because it's hugely prevalent and it's only going to increase with time. Hypertensive retinopathy, look, it's good to know about, particularly with malignant hypertension. So systolic over 200, patient comes in, headache, that's life-threatening, right? So they will often have papilledema. Have you guys heard of that word? Papilledema, so bilateral swollen optic nerves. Beyond that, um, look, it's good to know that, that uh, hypertension over a long period of time damages the blood vessels at the back of the eye, certainly can damage vision. But in Australia, it doesn't tend to be as much of a long-term public health problem. More commonly, long-term systemic hypertension can, is, a, is, is the most important risk factor for retinal vein occlusions, okay, retinal vein occlusions. I'm not going to talk about retinal vein occlusions today. They're in the other talk. But when you think about long-term uncontrolled high blood pressure, also think about the possibility of I mean, high blood pressure can cause bloody everything. Strokes, heart attacks. This is just another thing that it can cause. And vein occlusions are pretty common. I mean, I'd see someone every day with a, with a blocked vein. They also need injections into the eye, often. Sometimes they need laser treatment. Um, so hypertensive retinopathy is graded. I don't know that I'm going to test you on that. I just don't know how clinically relevant it is. I just want you to... Remember malignant hypertension, as I say, it's in the other talk. And be aware that the vascular changes from high blood pressure are real. We can see them in the eye. And there are some characteristic changes, cotton wool spots, exudates, bleeding, kind of similar to diabetic retinopathy, but it's not diabetic retinopathy because it can happen without diabetes. Okay, uh, has anyone seen a person with bad thyroid eye disease, okay. So look, not everybody with hypothyroidism gets thyroid eye disease, uh, but a proportion of them will. And who was the, who was the famous actor who had the really bulgy eyes? Was it John Candy? Does that ring a bell for anyone? No. Um, you can tell if someone's got big bulgy eyes from thyroid. Usually it's pretty obvious when they walk in the room. The way to think about thyroid eye disease is is it active or is it quiet, okay? So active means they are inflamed right now. And it starts with the muscles around the eye, the extraocular muscles. They're the things that first become inflamed and edematous. And then the contents of the whole eye socket kind of go up in volume. So what's the term for, what's it called when you've got a fixed volume or a fixed space but the volume inside that space is going up what's the name for that there's a name in medicine it can happen to a limb it can happen sorry yeah it's a compart so acute thyroid eye disease can cause a compartment syndrome which means it's going to put pressure on whatever is in that compartment and in in terms of the eye socket, it's the optic nerve, right? So the orbital contents can start to put pressure on the optic nerve. Somebody with acute thyroid eye disease is at risk of optic neuropathy. Thankfully, it doesn't happen very often, but the cues are, here's my hyperthyroid patient, and suddenly their eyes are quite red, 
They look more bulgy than usual. They're uncomfortable. Because what happens is when you get, what do you call it when your eyes bulge forwards? What's the word for that? Proptosis or exophthalmos? When that happens, it can be so bad that the eyelids can't close properly over the top of the eyelid, especially when a person sleeps. So they can probably clamp them shut if they use a bit of force. They go to bed at night, the eyelids are partly open. That's called lag ophthalmos, lag ophthalmos. And we talked about dry eye earlier. Having your eye half open all night or just a little bit open makes it very comf uncomfortable when you wake up in the morning. So thyroid patient, acutely red puffy eyes, they look more bulgy than usual, definitely uncomfortable, may or may not have visual symptoms. That's the acute phase of thyroid eye disease, okay? And it can happen at any stage in a hypothyroid patient. And the acute phase needs to be treated with high dose systemic steroids. So they'll often be admitted and treated with an IV methylprednisolone, okay? And you can have steroid sparing, sparing agents that are used over the longer term. It's kind of independent from their thyroid disease. So you can be euthyroid, so normal thyroid at that time with treatment, but still be getting actively inflamed eyes from thyroid eye disease. There's then the quiet phase of thyroid eye disease where the eyes can still be very prominent, Eyelids can still have trouble closing, even to the point where eye movements are impaired. Can happen acutely or, or, or down the track. Uh, so the treatment for those guys is not medical, it's surgical if it's needed. So if someone has disfiguring proptosis or they can't shut their eyelids, you can actually reduce the volume of the eye socket by removing some orbital traps. Um, so think of it as acute, urgent referral medical treatment, chronic causing problems with sight and life, comfort, surgical, okay? Smoking is a big modifier of all these factors, so always ask about smoking with thyroid patients. Okay, final condition. Um, how are you guys going? I can't believe it's almost been two hours already. We've probably got 15 minutes to go through. So are you okay to push through to the end or do you want a little breather? Mainly not, mainly not, okay. If these long talks could be split into two one hour talks on different days, is that better or is it better just to cop two hours in one go? Who's for splitting them up? Not many. Who's for one big smack? Okay, cool. All right, we'll keep it as it is. Okay. Um, has anyone heard of Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine? Heard of that medication? Yeah. What? Can you remember what the patient was being treated for? Okay. All right. That's a. That's a. In Australia, that's an uncommon cause for an unco rheumatological. Yeah, that's the most common reason. Australia. So you can see African patients with macular problems, macular toxicity from chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, but in Australia it tends to be for rheumatoid arthritis and SLE. They tend to be the most common uses of Plaquenil. Plaquenil is the trade name. So if you're on a high enough dose of Plaquenil for long enough, a proportion of patients get retinal toxicity. Thankfully it's very low. And every patient who's on Plaquenil should be seen by an ophthalmologist at some stage. The earlier, the better, so you can get baseline assessment of the eye, okay? So when they get it, it's called a bullseye maculopathy. Bullseye because it looks like the target in the center of a circle. So again, it might be difficult to appreciate on that photo, but if you've seen enough pictures of the eye and you look at the macula, the central part of the retina, if there's something that looks like a bullseye or a ring there, and it's a patient who's on hydroxychloroquine, that's your bullseye maculopathy from Plaquenil toxicity, okay? Important things with Plaquenil, A, it's early screening, B, it's the dose that the patient's on. And the way to think about dose is milligrams 
per kilogram per day, per kilogram of lean weight per day. And the important number there is around 5.5 to 6. That's the threshold that we consider to be risky, is if it's above 5.5 milligrams per, per kilogram per day or approaching that. The other one is if they've had a cumulative dose of over 1,000 grams. That normally takes at least five years to get to, to get to 1,000 grams, depending on what your daily dose is. Um, but you don't wait for 1,000 grams. You don't wait till they're on a high enough dose that it's 5.5 or higher per day. If someone's on plaquenil, they need to be seen because they might have other macular problems, which could mean that they're at higher risk of macular toxicity from plaquenil. So the take-home thing there is if you see plaquenil on someone's medication list, ask if they've been seen by an eye specialist. If not, make a referral. If they're complaining of visual symptoms, then obviously that's, you know, that's your answer. It's more urgent. Um, amiodarone. Do you see many patients who are on amiodarone these days, occasionally? Yeah. So this mainly causes, so plaquenil think of back of the eye, amiodarone think of front of the eye. I don't know if you can see that feathery looking spidery thing on the cornea. So that's called, we call that vortex keratopathy, and it's lip, lipid deposition in the cornea. It can happen in the lens as well from amiodarone. Optic neuropathy is pretty rare. I haven't seen one with amiodarone. Um, more its opacities on the cornea and the lens. And if they're progressing, they can obviously damage vision. So you want to switch that person to, a, to another agent. So if someone's got likely to be on long-term amiodarone, then get them to see someone. Or if they're on amiodarone and they're complaining of visual symptoms, then think about amiodarone toxicity. Two other common systemic medications. The first one is plain old prednisolone or systemic steroids of any form, really, whether it's oral, inhaled, topical, IV, whatever the case might be. They can raise the pressure in the eye, uh, particularly topical drops. That's the main thing with high pressure is topical drops. They can bring on cataract and they can also create this little blister of fluid at the back of the eye, which we call central serous chorioretinopathy. Don't expect you to know that particular um, condition, but just remember that steroids can, systemic steroids can cause problems in the lens or in the retina. Okay, just remember that. So I saw a young guy today who uses strong steroid cream and he had central serous chorioretinopathy, that condition that I'm talking about right now. Okay. <coughs> Tamsulosin, does anyone know what that medication is? Yeah, what's it used for? Can you remember? Yeah, BPH. So BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy, super common. A lot of men are on this. It's also, the trade name is Flomax. And if someone's on this and they need to see an ophthalmologist, make sure you put that in your referral, the reason is even being on Flomax for a short period of time, for some reason, leads to the pupil not being able to dilate properly and the pupil becomes very floppy. And where that becomes a problem is during cataract surgery because A, you can't dilate the pupil enough to be able to get to the lens or get to the cataract. That can create complications. We need to modify our technique for that. And B, a floppy pupil is a bit like, you know, we're creating incisions in the eye, right? And it's a bit like being in an airplane and someone opens the door. So the pupil flies out the door and flies into the wound that we've created. And that is a pain to manage. The pressure inside the eye is more than the pressure outside. So the anything that's floppy gets pushed out. And if someone's on Flomax, that's what happens. So it can cause intraoperative complications. So just mention it. You don't have to do anything. They stay on it for their BPH, but then we know how to prepare for it for, for surgery. So they're the four main drugs 
that I want you to remember. Um, let's briefly touch on a bit of epi and low vision. Really, what I want you to know here is glasses is the most common cause of impaired vision, not blindness, just simple need for glasses. Most common cause of blindness in Australia overall, wet macular degeneration or max advanced macular degeneration. Most common cause in a working age is diabetic retinopathy. So working age 40 to 60, diabetic retinopathy. Older people, macular degeneration. 60 plus, everybody gets cataracts. Aboriginal pa patients tend to have less access to services for a variety of reasons. So as a result, that's still the leading cause amongst Indigenous Australians. Um, yeah, and glaucoma is always in the mix as well. So when, it, when a patient walks in the room, you just want to know what are the common things? What are the common non-acute causes? Macular degen degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, cataract, need for glasses. Which one of those five? They're the leading causes of of vision impairment in Australia. Legal blindness is a vision of less than 6 over 60 in the better eye. What does 6 over 60 mean? 660 is the top letter on the eye chart. You know that the eye chart that you've probably all seen? The big top letter. Can't see that in my better eye, never mind my worse eye. That's legal blindness. So you'll get patients coming to you who have like average vision like me if I don't wear specs, and they'll say, can I please have a concession card or can I get a benefit for being blind? Uh, but actually they're not eligible because legal blindness is pretty bad vision. You know, can't see the eye chart at all. Or you've only got your central 10 degrees of vision. So we talked about glaucoma, giving you tunnel vision earlier. So if it's bad enough that you've only got a tiny bit in the middle, um, then that's legal blindness, even if the central visual acuity is intact. So your central visual acuity might be six over six, you know, 20, 20 vision, but all you can see is a tiny little circle in the middle. That's still considered legal blindness. Or if you've got so many visual field defects, let's say from diabetic retinopathy, um, that assessment needs to be made by an ophthalmologist, but that can also be considered legally blind. Drive room requirements, I've talked about, they're listed there. So just get comfortable with those. If someone has unilateral partial or complete loss of vision in one eye, then the advice is to not drive for three months. Any one-sided eye problem that does reasonable damage to vision, at least a month for people to adapt to those monocular cues of depth that I talked about earlier. Okay. Services that are available, what are the important? Look, j just be aware that there are lots of services available for people with vision impairment and blindness. So if someone loses vision, you don't just go, oh, sorry, um, good luck. Um, used to be called the Blind Association, Blind Association of WA. They're now called Visibility, Visibility. We've all got to use positive language these days. So you can look them up. Anyone can refer a patient for visibility. And they don't have to be legally blind to be referred for visibility. Those guys can help with mobility aids. There's lots of little aids, you know, uh, devices that can read for you, uh, little aids around the house. There's a little device which you put on the inside of a mug. When you're pouring hot water in, can't see starts to buzz as the mug gets full so you don't overfill burn your hands. Um, if you're eligible, then a guide dog potentially. So this is the kind of work that visibility does. Um, many years ago, I did a fundraising thing where I was blindfolded for 24 hours. So I sort of simulated being blind for a short period of time. And I worked with a visibility div uh, services organization so that I could do that safely so I had a sighted guide and I had all these little gadgets and bits and pieces helping me. It was only 24 hours, but it was pretty uncomfortable. I was really happy when the blindfold came off. Um, but 
all of those little devices and technologies and human support makes a big difference. So just remember that when you've got a patient who's visually impaired is you can still help them. Okay, I think that's a good note to, to end things on. Uh, I don't really have a conclusion. Um, really, it's just remember to think of things as being, I'm referring them today or I'm referring them within the next month. Um, the abbreviations are there for what I've used in the talk. And thank you for coming.